Bonjour, everybody. Um, it's a very unexpected pleasure for me to be here today. Um, you all might have expected someone else. And I have to say, when, when I received an email from Change Now on Saturday in order to, to come here and to replace Vandana Shiva, I went through quite a range of emotions. First, I was shocked, because how is it possible that someone like Vandana Shiva still has visa issues? I think that's completely unthinkable. Then came fear. How could I ever replace her? And then came excitement, because I decided to talk to you about something that I care very much about, and that I think we don't care, we don't speak enough about. And that is systemic thinking, and the role that systemic thinking plays in achieving the change that we all want to see. And to kick things off with, I want to do a little exercise with you. Now, I see some of you are having pen and paper. That's great. Please take it out, because I will ask you now to make a quick sketch. How do you think or feel how the world works. If you have pen and paper, please make a sketch. If you don't have pen and paper, you can also just join me, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and imagine it. That will be enough for the moment. Now I would love for those of you that made a sketch to show it to each other and to show it to your neighbors. And I think the number one thing that you will, be, that you will see, no one sketch will be the same as the other. Every single person here has a different worldview. And this is amazing because we are in a bubble. We're all climate change interested. Most of us are from a European context, yet no one worldview is ever the same as another. And this is the first key message that I would love to give you for today. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, who is this guy? And what the hell does what he has to say have to do with soil and the power of soil? And my own love for soil developed in this location, which is a tiny little village in the central Portuguese countryside. In 2017, me and a few friends decided to purchase this, at that point, abandoned village. And that also what made me the steward of a few hectares of land. And that's when my journey started. First into permaculture, then into regenerative agriculture. Back in 2017, regenerative agriculture wasn't a thing yet. There was no one speaking about it. But all the knowledge that we have now was already there. I found papers from Wageningen University from the 80s and 90s already speaking about the power of carbon sequestration through regenerative agriculture. Dr. Ratan Lal, who's one of the leading soil scientists, already made a statement back then that if we would increase global soil carbon by only 2%, we would be able to sequester more carbon than we are emitting as a human species on an annual basis. Now let that one think in. We have a solution to our, at least our carbon issue, but we're not acting up on it. We haven't been speaking about it, and it's still not happening at the scale where it should be. So I started looking into our agricultural system, and what I saw was really not pretty. Our agricultural system is fucked up. You all have seen the farmer protests in the last few months all over Europe. Those are just symptoms of a much bigger underlying issues. Over the last 50 years, farmers have consecutively been bashed in our agricultural system. A farmer nowadays, if you buy a liter of milk, gets 30 to 40% of the money that you're paying yet he does 90% of the labor. In the 70s, there was at least still 50 to 60%. So they're getting less and less money, while their costs are rising, and while they are the ones who are experiencing the effects of climate change the most. And they're left alone with that risk, and they're not getting paid for it. Which leads to the fact that farming is not sexy. Nobody puts being a farmer on their Tinder profile, nobody wants to become a farmer, and farmers are a dying out generation. They're in their late 50s, and there's no one to take their farms over. And that means we are full head towards a food crisis in the European Union. On top of that, we have a massive issue with the ecological impact on farming. Hopefully, you all know the planetary boundaries. 
an amazing concept invented by the Club of Rome, who are also present here. And agriculture is one of the main reasons for us crossing these planetary boundaries. It's the number one reason for biodiversity loss in the world, and it's responsible for 24% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Now remember, we could sequester carbon through agriculture, yet we are massively emitting it. And finally, you might think, at least it's driving an economy, right? But actually, if you look at the economic impact of agriculture, it's negative. Do you know why? Because we have costs of agriculture which are not accounted for in our, in our agricultural system. And those are health costs and environmental costs. The main company that's producing chemical fertilizer products is Bayer. You probably heard about glyphosate. We estimate that we have 11 billion euros in damages with health products. Who's selling you medicine? The same company that's selling the farmers the poison that made us sick in the first place. And we are supporting this, and we are subsidizing this in our system. It's crazy. So this is kind of where I was like, OK, how is this possible? We know we're generative agriculture. We know it builds biodiversity. We know it sequesters carbon. We know it helps with drought prevention and flooding prevention, because it also builds up salty salts, which soak up water. But it's not happening. And nobody is speaking about it. And that's where me and my co-founder Ivo started Climate Farmers in 2019, with one single goal, scaling regenerative agriculture in Europe and getting to at least 10% of all European farmland under regenerative management by 2027. 10% because we believe at that point we have enough farms which can function as role models for other farmers so that farmers can see a farm which is similar to their context, they can get inspired by it, and they can also jump on their train. And we believe once we get the 10%, we will have an avalanche effect. And we will get to 100%. Because it's just purely logical once you have seen the magic and the power of regenerative agriculture in action. When we started, we estimate we had about 1,000 to 2,000 farmers doing region ag. Now we have around 200,000. So we have 2%. Still nothing out of the 10 million farmers that we have in the European Union. So still a long way to go. Our overall mission as climate farmers is to see a world where humans found their place within the larger ecosystem again. We believe humans are a keystone species, an honorable title that we share with beavers, for example, which means we have a larger than, than most other animals' impact on our environment. Right now, we're destroying it. We're having a negative impact. We could turn this around, and we could have a positive impact. And we believe regenerative agriculture is the way to get there. So I went to business school in Maastricht. And what you learn in business school when you study entrepreneurship is, if you build a company, you laser focus on one thing, you get one thing right, and that's it. Everything else is just distracting. It's called linear thinking. It's what we all are doing. And in a linear thinking mindset, the logical thing would be, farmers sequester carbon, there's a voluntary carbon market, so we generate carbon credits and we pay farmers. End of story, right? And then I went out. And I went on a one-year journey. And I visited 60 farmers in nine countries, 60 regenerative farmers. And I asked them, how are you doing? What do you think could help you? What do you think about carbon credits? And I realized things are a lot more complex than that. Because the issue is carbon credits won't fix it. Farmers which are already doing regenerative agriculture get often mobbed by their conventional colleagues because their mindset is not there. The culture is not there. So they very often feel lonely, and they are even thinking of leaving the track, even though they see the results because of the social pressure. Farmers that are not on the track yet don't know how to do it. Regenerative agriculture is highly context-specific, and there's no education out there right now that is enabling farmers to learn how to apply regenerative agriculture in their context. There's no coaches, there's no trainers, there's no infrastructure. On top of that, the money for carbon is not enough to finance the transition, and farmers only get paid for yield. So they only get paid for maximizing their yield. If the yield goes down, they get less money, despite all the positive side effects. And on top of that, we have a massive issue with subsidies in the European Union, which are heavily influenced by the agrochemical industry and which pay the majority of money for farmers. So what do we do? We did a systems mapping, which basically means you look at who are the different actors in the agricultural field, how are they all interlinked with each other, and where are these acupuncture points that you need to push in order to make that happen? If you want to learn more about it, there's two amazing organizations out there which we are working with, which is the Presencing Institute and Reimagine Futures. Big shout out to both of them. In a systems map, what you have is you have hundreds of different feedback loops 
And I'm just going to explain you one now as an example of all of the other ones. And this is the classic one which I already touched upon. We have a dominance of a conventional agriculture system. This dominance leads to several companies such as Bayer and Syngenta making massive amounts of money. Now in our capitalist system, what do you do when you have a lot of money? You hire a lot of lobbyists and you let these lobbyists influence politics. Bayer has the most amount of lobbyists of any organization in the world in Brussels. What does that lead to? Inadequate policy, because the politicians are obviously influenced by the lobbyists. What do they do? They pass laws that generate subsidies that give farmers money to buy more agrochemical products. Through that, the agrochemical com companies make more money again, and we have a perfect loop of doom as it's running. This is one example. Trust me, there's a lot of other loops which are similarly depressive in that map, unfortunately. So where do you start? Donella Meadows is someone like the queen of systems thinking, and she came up with a leverage point for systems transformation. There are three key leverage points there, which is cultural, structural, and practical. The most impactful one is the cultural one. So this is where we began. And we started connecting the farmers. They were lonely, and they didn't know each other. You see my slowly balding hat on the right top, together with a regenerative wine farmer from Portugal. And we brought all of these farmers together, first online during the pandemic, and then in person. And then we organized a conference in Germany, where we organized farmers from 20 countries, as well as policy leaders, uh, academics, industry leaders, businesses, to come together and to start thinking who are the different players and how can we form a web and how can we work together to achieve the systemic change that we want to see. We also started coaching and trainings online and offline by farmers and for farmers to inspire them to learn from each other and to have the strength to go on this journey to leave the path of conventional agriculture. By now, we have farmers across Europe and we have a map where you can see all of them and how they can all be interacting with each other and connecting with each other, mostly through WhatsApp groups, because let's face it, that's where farmers are. Then we focus on the structural part. And last summer, I had a very happy moment because we were working with a, with a club of Rome together in order to work on the nature restoration law, the most progressive law to protect nature in Europe. And the far right parties are working with the agrochemical industry to claim that farmers hate this law. That's not the case. So we collected more than 100 signatures from large-scale regenerative farmers across Europe, which all say, we love the nature restoration law because it gives us finally the basis to start paying farmers for biodiversity, which they don't right now. The law has been very watered down by now, but at least it's a step in the right direction, and it's a kind of action that we need to see. We also wrote a manifesto together with farmers from 21 countries, where farmers laid out what they think needs to happen to help them in adopting regenerative agriculture. And then, last year, we were involved in starting EARA, which is the first lobby organization for regenerative agriculture, by farmers, for farmers, with farmers from, 50, from 20 different countries. And then, we have the practical ones. And here, we're focused on measuring, and we're focused on collecting data, and figuring out how we can help farmers to understand the complexities of regenerative agriculture. In the center, we have a farm health report card, which is a tool for farmers to understand their own context better and how the transition to region ag can look like for them. Around that, we have carbon credits. They're one tool in the toolbox. They're not the linear thinking solution, but they're one of the many things that are a tool to help farmers. And on top of that, we're currently developing a regenerative agriculture certification, similar to the organic certification, but outcome-based, not practice-based, and with farmers in mind. Farmers hate organic verification and we need farmers to love the verification for them to engage in it. Now, the biggest issue here, and this is the other thing that I really want to leave you with, in the entire impact sector, we have a massive financing issue. When I started looking into impact startups, I found a lot of impact VCs, and I was like, oh, great, there's a lot of money available. The problem is, you get money for data. You get money for tech. Tech is sexy. Nobody gives you money for culture, Nobody gives you money for structural change. I haven't found a single VC that's actually interested in systemic investment. Into tech investment, which gives you a quick return on investment? Excellent. You want to work on cultural stuff? Mm, not really. That's a problem, because as you see on the scale, you need the cultural work and the structural work for the technical work to actually make a difference. OK, so now you might be wondering, what does this mean for me? If you're an investor and you want to learn about systemic investment more, I would love to talk to you. 
If you're wanting any kind of organization and you want to learn about it, I would also love to talk to you. But most importantly, for every single person here, I would ask for you to ask yourself, where's your food coming from? How much money that you are spending for your food is ending up in the pockets where you want it to end up? And what can you change? It's very easy nowadays to get to know your farmers. This the CSA is all over Europe, and you can start figuring out how can I buy food that actually supports the white way of farming? And how can we all work together to make farming sexy again? Thank you very much.